So hi everyone um, and welcome to our event on TSD and pregnancy with antenatal results and choices or ARP. Um, you may have already been to TSA virtual events before and be used to how they run by now um, but in case not I'll just run through some quick housekeeping um, and then pass over to Jane at ARC because I'm sure that's why you're actually here. Um, so I'm Anna, I'm the support line manager at the TSA. Um, you probably used to Luke presenting these events, but we thought we'd give you a little bit of a break today. <laughs> um, so please feel free to either keep your cameras on or off throughout. Um, and you can also engage in questions in the chat if you'd like, but there's, as there's only a few of us, um, you might want to, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, but you might want to ask some questions throughout as well. Um, but I just want to say that this is a confidential and safe space. So although it is being recorded, as you were notified at the beginning, um, please let us know if you know you don't want to be on the recording. We usually do cut out any of the questions that you'd ask anyway. So um, yeah, feel free to ask any questions that you want to because it's a safe, safe space. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Jane. Thanks very much, Anna, and thanks to Anna and Luke for inviting me to talk to you this evening. I was, I did have a deck of slides, and then I suddenly thought, no, I think it, as we're a small group of people, it'd be much nicer just to talk these things through. But what I wanted to say up front is that I know that we're dealing with a particularly sensitive subject this evening. I don't know all your histories and where you're, how you're coming at this, so... Some of what I say may touch a nerve, and I apologize in advance for that. But it, it does, it, it, of course, when we're dealing with prenatal diagnosis and a potentially difficult and painful decision making, it is, it, some of it is going to be sensitive. So I, I wanted to say that up front. So, what I thought I'd do just as a, a preamble is tell you a bit about my organization. I'm not sure if any of you, all of you are aware or any of you are aware of the organization. Then talk briefly about perhaps the pathway of, of prenatal diagnosis, thinking about those people that may get a first diagnosis in pregnancy and then moving on to, to, to think about those who know there's a chance that they may have a baby with. TSC and what that might mean in relation to how their pregnancy is organized and, and, and also think about some of the, the difficult psychological implications of all that. And please stop me as we go through. Um, I don't know if the, the chat is, is um, up and running. Um, yeah. Do put things in the chat, don't be shy. And I'll um, start off. So. Our organization is actually celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. So we've been around a long time, but we've not always been called ARC. Something perhaps important to say up front is that our origins are from a charity called Support After Termination for Fetal Abnormality, or SATFA for short. We, that was a charity that was started in the mid 80s. And it was quite important that it was started in the mid 80s because that was the time when prenatal diagnosis and fetal medicine was really being established as a separate medical discipline. And perhaps the conventional wisdom among some clinicians at the time was that we've got better scans, we've got amniocentesis where we can provide genetic testing so we can tell parents about a diagnosis in their baby. And if it's a serious diagnosis, we can offer them a termination of pregnancy, they can have a termination, move on and get a healthy baby next time. And I probably don't have to tell you that the impact, one, of getting a diagnosis and two, facing a harrowing and difficult decision-making process in the context of a wanted pregnancy to potentially end that pregnancy is really, really difficult. And both the practical and emotional needs of those parents were overlooked. They, it was a time too, I think in the mid eighties when perinatal psychologists were starting to understand that pregnancy, loss, stillbirth was a really significant bereavement 
and starting to, to, to take that on board and, and to make sure that women and couples were offered support around these circumstances. But those who'd ended a pregnancy after a diagnosis sometimes felt that they were not deserving of bereavement support or care because they'd made an active decision. They felt implicated in the loss. And so they thought, well, that support should be there for those couples that have had the tragic circumstances of a stillbirth, but we made a decision. And of course, when you think about it, although we wouldn't want to create any hierarchy of loss, that adds another dimension of difficulty to that loss. They've actually had to sign a form, a form for an abortion in the context of knowing that they're carrying a much loved and wanted baby, which is really psychologically challenging. And so when we were set up, we were set up specifically to try and meet their needs, both practically and emotionally. And I think the other telling thing about the way we were established was that it was a group of bereaved parents and healthcare professionals that set up the charity. The parents obviously knew because it was such a difficult experience that they their needs weren't met and the health professionals recognized that they weren't perhaps providing the highest quality. So that's how we started. And for the first, I guess, probably about 10 years, that was what we concentrated on, trying to improve care when people were facing that difficult circumstance of ending a pregnancy. But as we progressed, we set up a helpline and we're getting more and more calls from people in all sorts of different circumstances. So women and couples who were perhaps confronted with findings from a scan that, that they weren't sure what they meant, what should they do next? Should they consider having amniocentesis? Where could they go to get expert information about the implications of findings for their baby? And over time, we thought, well, we, we really ought to better uh, really show what we do, show that our remit. So in 1998, we became antenatal results and choices to recognize that we were dealing with people at all sorts of stages, not just people who decided to end their pregnancy. So we became ARC in 1998. And interestingly, some of the couples, I think we, that was before my time, but some of the couples we supported were actually quite disappointed that we changed our name because there's no doubt that there's still huge stigma and taboo and shame and guilt around termination of pregnancy. And some of those parents said, well, here was the only charity that was specifically supporting people in our different circumstances. And they've decided to remove that from their name. Are they not too just trying to hide this experience because they don't want to talk about it? And I think it's important that we say that that wasn't a reason for changing the name. We really did want to better reflect what we did and I guess the trustees at the time also thought perhaps that by changing our name from SAPFA to ARC, it might be easier to fundraise because we were never an easy charity to fundraise for. That didn't necessarily happen. And what we have kept in place, and I think, again, it's important to say, is that we still provide specialized bereavement support for those that end the pregnancy because no one else does that. But that doesn't mean that we have any investment in the decisions parents make in pregnancy. What is absolutely crucial to us is in these difficult circumstances, parents are provided with all they need, medical expertise, information, support to make the decisions that are right for them in their unique circumstances. They have to live long-term with the decisions they make. So it's really important that they're helped to make the best possible decision in what can be incredibly challenging circumstances. So that's what we endeavor to do. We, we recognize that we at ARC on our helpline deal with anything and everything that can be picked up in pregnancy. So when the diagnosis is made, we will make sure that we signpost to those condition specific organizations that can provide really good information on what the lived experience can be of a particular condition. So obviously in the context of tuberous sclerosis diagnosis, we would signpost sign to the TSA as a good pair of hands to help them think through what living with the condition for their child 
might be like. When it comes to what we offer, we have a, a helpline. Here I am in one of the rooms in our central London office. We have a, help, a telephone helpline. People can call Monday to Friday, two evenings a week to people contact us either by phone, by email quite often, by live chat. And we're just about to start up a text messaging service because we recognize that many people now find it difficult to make that first contact by phone. You can feel a bit onerous to call an organization you have no idea about. So text messaging can be a nice way to, to do that first, um, make that first move of contact. So we do that. We uh, provide, I suppose, what we would say, guidance and information through our helpline that helps people recognize where they might go for extra information and, su and support should they need it. We also have a number of publications and a website that can help direct people to sources of, again, information and support. As I say, we still provide the bereavement um, service for people. But I guess when it comes to, to the helpline, which is our core service, the five of us now that take calls, we're up to our biggest complement of the Healthline team, all share something in common. We're not healthcare professionals. We have a pretty stiff induction before we take calls, but we're all, I think, very good listeners and good at dealing with people in acute anxiety and distress. So we're, we're able to contain people to help them work out a way forward when they feel sometimes quite overwhelmed by all that's going on. They can be in shock from information they've had from a scan or genetic test. So I think that, that is a great strength. So we obviously offer the parent support, but at the same time, we have this dual purpose of also working with healthcare professionals that's come out really of our founding. So we do a lot of professional training, we work at policy making level two to try and feedback what we hear from both parents and professionals to those that are making decisions about test implementation to try and make that work to parent benefit and make sure that it's practical on the ground too. So I sit on the fetal maternal and child health expert group that feeds into the UK National Screening Committee that makes decisions about implementing screening tests. And I also work closely with the Fetal Anomaly Screening Program that standardizes screening across um, England, Scotland and Wales. Northern Ireland is slightly different. And I'm pleased to say we, we actually have a worker there recently established to try and help move care on in Northern Ireland because things aren't quite what they could be over there at the moment. So we do the professional facing work and, and policy work as well. And we're more and more often involved in research as well. As you'll be aware, it's very difficult for clinicians to get funding for research if they don't involve patient and public facing organizations. That voice is very important in, in, in research now. So we're happy again to be involved if we think the research will be of parent benefit. We're happy to, to obviously make sure that research is ethical and that, that the, the outputs will, will really make a difference to moving care forward, improving testing, diagnosis, et cetera. So kind of in a nutshell, that's what we do. We obviously as a charity, you all know, you're a charity. Fundraising is a tough ask and you need to prove to funders that you fulfill a need. So when we audit our service users, I think the three things that come back from people about what they value from us is one, our independence, that we're not part of their healthcare team, we're separate from their friends, family, colleagues. It's a safe place to discuss what can be really quite tricky and sensitive stuff. That we have what beleaguered health care professionals often don't have almost unlimited time to stay with people on a call, to have, to have regular email contact. People can visit us in our London offices should they want to. So we have time to help them work out a way forward. And going back to what I was saying about our ability to be with people in distress, we can support them 
provide that support when they can often be quite taken aback at just how anxious and distressed they are by news they've got from pregnancy. So in a nutshell, that's kind of us. I don't know if anyone's got any questions about our organization. I should also say actually that we do work closely with quite a lot of um, condition specific groups. We've recently undertaken a piece of work with Genetic Alliance UK, with Unique, the charity that deals with rare chromosomal conditions, Down Syndrome Association, and some other advocates who have children with genetic conditions to try and look at how we can make sure that prenatal screening and diagnosis is framed in a way that is sensitive to the situation of people living with conditions. That we make sure that the language is inclusive, that the training of health care professionals includes um, training in explaining conditions in a balanced way, that they're signposting to places where people can get a better view of, of conditions in the round. So how, how it can be to live with a condition, not just the medical facts. So that's something too that we're pleased to be involved in because we think it's important. So that's us in a nutshell. Any questions about our organization? I've realized that I can't see the chat. Any questions thus far? Okay, so if I move on to thinking about TSC in the context of pregnancy. So to start with those parents that are given a diagnosis for the first time in pregnancy and what we would, what we would imagine would happen to them and our role in supporting them. So if somebody calls us saying that perhaps initially scan features have been detected that might be indicative of TSC, so perhaps tumours somewhere, something like that. It's the fact, obviously, we'll acknowledge the anxiety that this is provoked. And again, I'm sure I don't have to say to you that getting unexpected news from a scan is, and I don't use the word light, lightly, is for some, some women and couples quite traumatic because scans are a unique feature, I think, in medical care, they're most often something that in pregnancy people find pleasurable. People actually want scans. There's a whole business built up around scanning where people go for their 3D scans for to bring family and friends to meet the baby, to bond with the baby, etc. It's quite unique perhaps in healthcare. And although people know intellectually perhaps that there is the possibility of difficult news from scans. Most people don't think it'll happen to them. And so when a sonographer gives the first indication that something is unexpected in what they've seen or they've seen something they have concerns about, the impact of that is experienced by many women as an almost physical shock. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how often that it's described in that way. You know, I felt, I felt kind of air go out of my lungs. I felt the room close in on me. I just started crying uncontrollably. It's, it's a really significant moment when they get the first indication that something's going on. And often from that first scan, they're then told, well, this is your... Um, anatomy anomaly scan. I'm a sonographer. I've, I'm here to look at the images. And obviously, if I find things, I tell you about them, but I'm not a fetal medicine specialist. So next, we'll schedule you with an appointment with somebody that might be able to give you more information about findings we've, we've um, what, the, what's come up today. And that can be uh, a weight that is of varying times. I mean, some units pride themselves on the fact that they have fetal medicine on site. So a couple can go immediately from that scan straight to a fetal medicine consultant. Now we would say that has its pluses and minuses. Some couples are craving information as quickly as possible. 
but it can be very difficult to take in more information when you're in a state of shock. So to make the most of that second appointment can be difficult if it's immediate. And so part of our role can be if people make contact with us between that initial scan and their fetal medicine appointment, we can help them contain themselves and perhaps write down the questions they want to put to fetal medicine when they get there. We can help them work out what perhaps what they might expect at that appointment. We can check where they're going because something that we're aware of as an organization is where the centers of excellence for fetal medicine are. And I have to say that I've been with ARC, I should have mentioned that up front, this is my 22nd year at ARC. And we are, I have spent the last 10 years working with specialized commissioning in NHS England, trying to, what they're trying to do is define what fetal, specialist fetal medicine service is. It's never been properly and formally defined. We're nearly there. After 10 years trying, I would hope by the summer, we will have a proper definition of fetal medicine services, which will be so much better for parents to actually know where the centers of excellence are, to know what happens where and where they can see specialists. But as I was saying, we can help people negotiate that, know what to expect from that next appointment. And then obviously, obviously support them through the decisions that may fall out of the next steps. And obviously with TSC, that may be considerations of having invasive prenatal procedures. So most often probably amniocentesis because the, the scan findings are likely to be found perhaps at a 20 week scan. And obviously it's never easy to have an invasive prenatal procedure because it does come with a risk of miscarrying the pregnancy. It's a test that uses a pretty long needle to go through the abdomen to take, in the case of amniocentesis, a little a couple of teaspoons of amniotic fluid around the baby for analysis to, to look at the baby's chromosomes and, and genetic makeup. And unfortunately, even in 2023, it is still the only way for most conditions to get a conclusive result in pregnancy. So if somebody wants to get a genetic diagnosis, most often they will have to make the decision to have that procedure. The, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists put the risk of miscarriage from the procedure at about 0.5%. Many doctors will say that that's potentially overplayed, but it is even so um, always difficult, you know, just the, the sim symbolism of the procedure to have to lie there prone with your, your, your belly there and this big needle, when obviously your first instinct as an expectant mother is to protect and look after your baby. So it's never easy to have, but it is the only way to get that information. So it would help couples make a decision as to whether they wanted that and then support them through the wait for that new news from the infant from the the test and obviously that's a can be a very anxiety laden wait there's not much you can do and we try to make sure that people aren't googling madly for the whole time through that waiting period obviously they might want to gather information if they have a if if their clinical team has suggested it may be TSC, but it, it's, it's important too in that waiting time to have to, to, to try to have some downtime because the, the psychological load of waiting and, and, and potentially contemplating the next steps is fairly major. They then, this is talking obviously about a first time pregnancy, they get their result and um, TSC is potentially confirmed. Obviously, the healthcare team then will say to them, will offer them the options. They will say, well, now you know your baby has this condition. Obviously, we can talk to you about what that might mean for your baby and your baby's care. We can signpost you to sources of information support, i.e. like the TSA, and you can continue with the knowledge that your baby has the condition. Or we can offer you in this circumstance a termination of pregnancy. Um, and where we come in there is sometimes to help people 
work out a way forward that they feel is best in their circumstances. Now, one of the things that parents come to us really struggling with, with a diagnosis of TSC, is not knowing quite how it's going to be for their child. Again, you're the experts on this condition, but you'll know that there are potentially a range of outcomes and a range of features that, 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 that their child may or may not have. And as we stand, no prenatal tests. They may be able to talk about the, the location of tumors and, and give some indication as to the physical ramifications of what might be ahead. But in terms of um, neurological outcomes, they can't always be sure. And that's something most couples will struggle with, trying to work out the what ifs here in pregnancy. And again, I appreciate those of you who perhaps have the condition or have children with the condition, it can be very hard for you to psychologically think about that and, and put your own experience aside. But obviously for parents for whom this is new, they don't have experience of this. They're trying to imagine their future with a, a child, baby with the condition, what that might be like. And much of what we will do is to check with them that they have as much information as possible about the range of outcomes. And then they really do have to work out what they kind, what, what they can, can cope with. And that comes down to their psychological ability to cope with uncertainty, their experience, their makeup in relation to whether they can move ahead being optimistic about the potential outcomes or less optimistic. And that's very personal, very individual. Some couples will move forward thinking, no, we're gonna go with this and hope with whatever happens and hope for the best. Others will recognize that that's not something they can tolerate. So again, that is sort of where, where we are with people who are given a diagnosis for the first time. I, there's a question in the chat about um, tumours after following amniocentesis. Sorry, I, I, I don't know if I, maybe I was misleading there. Um, I meant that the scans are, are looking at the location of the tumours and I just meant that specialists may be able to look at the tumours, the number of tumours, the size, et cetera, and give some indication as to the physical outcomes from that, what, what effect that might have physically on the baby stroke child, what they can't do, and obviously from amniocentesis, they can, they can, they can confirm whether the, there is the, the gene change there for TSC. What they can't do from any prenatal test is, is give a clear indication of the outcome for that particular child with TSC. And that's, that's what I think um, many parents uh, struggle with. And obviously, yes, we too, as is, is in the chat there would make would part of our uh, part, part of something that we, we feel very strongly about is that they are given the very best information up to date evidence based information about what they might be looking at. That's really important. So that's first diagnosis for those parents that know they either have the condition themselves or, or carry the condition. I would hope and again it's something we would check with them if they come to us that they did have access to a genetic counsellor and that should be accessible through a regional genetics um, service because they will be a good, again, source of support um, through the pathway that, again, to talk through the pathway that that particular couple may prefer to, to take. And again, I'm not sure how aware you are about the, the, the basically the, the two options in relation if people want to test to see if their baby has the condition, there will be the option to have a naturally conceived pregnancy and look at having the earliest genetic test they could have would be what's called chorionic villus sampling or CVS that can be done from 10 weeks. Again, it involves a needle through, usually through the tummy, to collect a little um, tiny bit of placental tissue from the edge of the placenta 
that they send to a laboratory for analysis and through that they could see whether the baby had TSE or not. For some couples who uh, that, that feels very difficult because they're left in a situation where they may have to, to contemplate having a termination process. And for some couples that feels like a step too far. If a couple feels that termination, that, that they don't want to have a child that has the condition, but termination is not something they could contemplate. The other option then would be to go down the route of assisted conception of IVF. Now, I'm no expert. I can't pretend to be an expert on all the ins and outs of IVF. Again, a genetic counsellor will be able to help um, access that. It's not easy. I mean, some couples in first view think, well, that's a way of avoiding ending a pregnancy. It is, but it doesn't come without its challenges. It's psychologically and physically very challenging um, for women to, to um, undergo. It isn't always successful. The success rates are probably around 30 to 40 percent. And you've also got the weight, really, because what happens in the case of IVF is that the embryos are tested before they're implanted to, to, to try to take a pregnancy forward. So the embryos will be tested for the TSC gene before implement, impl implementation. So there's that difficult weight to test the embryos. There will be questions as to how, how many embryos there are for testing, et cetera. So it's not without its challenges, but I certainly know those parents who have taken that on and been successful and had a baby through that route. And again, part of our role at ARC is to support parents through what can be an anxiety laden journey through a pregnancy where they know there's a possibility their baby might have a condition. We can't do much to change that, but we are there again as a safe, confidential uh, space for them to offload their anxieties, to be with somebody who has an understanding of the difficulties. And, and again, they can, it can be helpful sometimes. They'll have, I'm sure, support from friends and family, but to go somewhere where they can, you know, nothing's going to phase us, nothing's going to upset us. They can say what they like, they can turn the air blue, whatever helps get them through. We're very much there to, to, to play that role. So um, looking at the chat, just going to see if there's anything. Um, sorry, Anna, I'm not very good at multitasking. Do you want, is there anything in the chat that I could pick up? No problem. Um, I'm just having a read through. I think both um, Lizzie and Daisy have kind of replied again to um, my replies to their questions in the chat. Um, so let me just read it. Um, So at what, do, you, do you know at what stage um, genetic testing would be for TSD? Um, okay. Sorry, one thing I should have said, because I think it, that's, there's, there's part of it here, is that it's not always easy to diagnose TSC initially in pregnancy. There will be people who are not prenatally diagnosed because the, that there aren't that many tumors or the tumors aren't seen. So sorry, I should have made that point that it's not something that would be routinely found in pregnancy. And I know there are some people that will have a postnatal diagnosis and perhaps because of what is the question, why it wasn't found. It's not something that, that is always picked up, but if it is, it's usually because a scan has, has found tumors and from there the in investigations are taken forward to, to look for the condition. So sorry, I should have made that point that it's not always found in pregnancy, which obviously can be difficult. Um, so if somebody knows that there's, uh, they've had a previous diagnosis, and obviously for a lot of people, it won't be the case that necessarily there will be, you know, that they, they, they don't carry the gene. So there won't necessarily be the possibility of it happening again, but there will be anxiety. And so what I would hope would happen 
would be, and then what we would lobby for, is that the healthcare team would do their utmost to get people in early for scans, to make sure those scans are done by fetal medicine specialists, having a careful look at the baby top to toe, look at checking the baby's heart really carefully to try and give as much reassurance through the pregnancy that the baby is, is unaffected. But the only way to know for sure would be to have an invasive procedure and the earliest that could be done would be the CVS at 10 weeks. Thanks, Jane. There is um, another question from Lizzie, which is, would it be more likely to be picked up if I have TSC myself or can it always be difficult to find? I think, well, it, I, sorry, again, you're the experts in this condition. And, and my understanding is that they would have to know the the, the, the actual gene change. So, yeah, so if, they, if, yeah, if they're aware of that, then they would be able to test for it. Um, but it's not always possible. Um, if they know the exact change they're looking for, if they know exactly what they're looking for, then they can they can do so. But they can't if they don't know the exact change, then that can be hard. So if I can just jump in there, so my so I, I'm I'm Luke, I'm the, the joint chief executive at the TSA. I've been hiding away, but I've been listening. I promise. Uh, so if it if it helps, Lizzie. Um, so, so if 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 you're diagnosed with it, it, it exactly as Jane said, if you're diagnosed with with TSC, um, the it, it's it's more it's more likely to to a certain extent to be diagnosed in any children that you have because they they're keeping an eye out for it. Um, so every if if you or your partner has TSC and then you have children, there's a fifty percent chance that your first child will have TSC. There's also a fifty percent chance that your next child will, and, and so it goes yep. on. So they will be aware. Um, it, it, it tends to be that genetic testing would be would be a possibility, um, depending on where you are. Um, and as as Jane said, it, they would be sort of looking looking for it more. I'd say, um, yep. Yep. but it's yeah, yeah, and, and and unfortunately, again, just to reiterate what Jane said. There is the the very difficult situation where TSE isn't picked up on, um, and then a, the child ha then does have TSC. Um, again, it's it's more the it's more the fact it's so difficult to to find if if that genetic testing isn't happening. Focused, yeah, it's not focused, and and exactly. yes, it's not it's not if if an amniocentesis is performed perhaps because somebody's had an increased chance of Down syndrome. They're not going to be looking for TSC. No, they're not focusing in that way. So that's why it can be missed. Yeah, exactly. So thank you. Thank you. Good, good question. So um, I'll put that as a close, I think, after after that discussion. So thank you to everyone. As I say, it's it's a it's an incredibly challenging topic to to discuss, but that's that's what we're here for. We're here for the challenging yeah. things as well as the good and the bad. Um so, yes, yeah, so thank you. Do, do you keep an eye out on any other uh, TSA events in two, two or three weeks? Um, I can't remember. Yeah, in two weeks. In two weeks, we have um, a event focused on the ketogenic diet, if, if anyone has TSA-related epilepsy. Um, and then we'll be going onwards from there to, to further events as well. So, again, thank you. Thank you, everyone, once more.